chemical bonding. A compound is defined as a substance that is made up of two or more different elements chemically combined. A molecule is defined as a substance made up of two or more atoms chemically combined. For your legal certificate, you may be required to identify if a substance is a compound or a molecule. Below are some examples in which you must state if they are a compound or a molecule. Simply remember definitions and apply to the examples. For instance, H2 contains only one type of element and two atoms. Therefore, it must only be a molecule. Chlorine, Cl, only one element and only one atom. Therefore, it is neither a molecule or a compound. Whereas NH3 and H2O both contain more than one type of element, there is more than one atom, therefore they are both a molecule and a compound. Oxygen, that's oxygen gas, again contains one type of element and two atoms, therefore it is only a molecule. All compounds are molecules, but not all molecules are compounds. The octet rule states that atoms tend to reach an electron arrangement with eight electrons in the outermost orbit when bonding occurs. You should already be familiar with ionic and covalent bonding from tuna cycle. For your leaving certificate, you need to be aware of the subdivisions within bonding. This only applies for covalent bonding. We will go into detail on this type of bonding shortly. For both ionic and covalent bonding, there are several headings you need to be able to discuss. Definitions, examples, their properties and possible subdivisions. An ion is defined as a charged atom or group of atoms. An ionic bond is defined as the force of attraction between oppositely charged ions in a compound. For your junior cycle, you are expected to draw an ionic compound. Sodium chloride, aka table salt, is the most well-known example of ionic bonding. As ionic bonding only deals with the outermost orbit, chemists represent ionic bonding using dot and cross diagrams. This is easier than doing the Bohr diagram as that is more time consuming to draw. Sodium is in group 1 and therefore has one electron in its outermost orbit. Chlorine however is in group 7, therefore has seven electrons in its outermost orbit. Don't forget to include the charges. Sodium is losing one electron, so it is becoming more positive, whereas chlorine is gaining an electron, therefore becoming more negative. Bonding occurs due to atoms wanting to become stable, i.e. both have a full outer orbit. For your leaving certificate, you should know at least three ionic properties. Ionic bonds have no subdivisions. You must apply the same headings to covalent compounds. A covalent compound is defined as a sharing of electrons between two elements or more. Similar to ionic bonding, you can simply do a dot and cross diagram. We will look at these in detail later. Covalent properties are the exact opposite of ionic bonding properties. One of the most important properties is the fact that shapes can vary for covalent molecules. 
bionic molecules, atoms are locked into a crystal lattice, but this isn't the case for covalent bonding. CSEPR stands for Phalent Shell Electron Pair Repulsion Theory. Phalency represents the number of electrons required to form a full outer orbit. The steps to identifying the shape for any covalent compound. Step 1. Identify the central atom. This is the atom that is on its own. Step 2. State the group that elements are in. These groups correspond exactly to the number of electrons in their outermost orbit. Step 3. Draw in the outermost electrons for the central atom, as far apart as possible. Step 4. Put in the other atoms to bond with electrons for the central atom. Step 5. Double check if there are any lone pairs. Simply check the central atom if it has all of its electrons bonded. If it has two or four electrons not bonded, then these are the lone pairs. Step 6. Identify the degrees between bonds and name the shape. Finally, step 7. Account for the shape by stating the number of bonds and the number of lone pairs. The steps to identifying the shape for any covalent compound. Step 1. Identify the central atom. This is the atom that is on its own. Step 2. State the group that elements are in. These groups correspond exactly to the number of electrons in their outermost orbit. Step 3. Draw in the outermost electrons for the central atom, as far apart as possible. Step 4. Put in the other atoms to bond with electrons for the central atom. Step 5. Double check if there are any lone pairs. Simply check the central atom if it has all of its electrons bonded. If it has two or four electrons not bonded, then these are the lone pairs. Step 6. Identify the degrees between bonds and name the shape. Finally, step 7. Account for the shape by stating the number of bonds and the number of lone pairs. The steps to identifying the shape for any covalent compound. Step 1. Identify the central atom. This is the atom that is on its own. Step 2. State the group that elements are in. These groups correspond exactly to the number of electrons in their outermost orbit. Step 3. Draw in the outermost electrons for the central atom, as far apart as possible. Step 4. Put in the other atoms to bond with electrons for the central atom. Step 5. Double check if there are any lone pairs. Simply check the central atom if it has all of its electrons bonded. If it has two or four electrons not bonded, then these are the lone pairs. Step 6. Identify the degrees between bonds and name the shape. Finally, step 7. Account for the shape by stating the number of bonds and the number of lone pairs. The steps to identifying the shape for any covalent compound. Step 1. Identify the central atom. This is the atom that is on its own. Step 2. State the group that elements are in. These groups correspond exactly to the number of electrons in their outermost orbit. Step 3. Draw in the outermost electrons for the central atom, as far apart as possible. Step 4. Put in the other atoms to bond with electrons for the central atom. Step 5. Double check if there are any lone pairs. Simply check the central atom if it has all of its electrons bonded. If it has two or four electrons not bonded, then these are the lone pairs. Step 6. Identify the degrees between bonds and name the shape. Finally, step 7. Account for the shape by stating the number of bonds and the number of lone pairs. The steps to identifying the shape for any covalent compound. Step 1. Identify the central atom. This is the atom that is on its own. Step 2. State the group that elements are in. These groups correspond exactly to the number of electrons in their outermost orbit. Step 3. 
draw in the outermost electrons for the central atom as far apart as possible. Step 4. Put in the other atoms to bond with the electrons for the central atom. Step 5. Double check if there are any lone pairs. Simply check the central atom if it has all of its electrons bonded. If it has two or four electrons not bonded, then these are the lone pairs. Step 6. Identify the degrees between bonds and name the shape. Finally, step 7. Account for the shape by stating the number of bonds and the number of lone pairs. While we are discussing shapes of covalent compounds, we should note that any molecule that contains a double or triple bond is automatically classified as a linear shape. You need to know a little about sigma and pi bonding. They both refer to the way orbitals overlap. To be honest, this is always a section that you are better off learning rather than understanding simply because you need a lot more information to understand this topic. However, for your leave certificate, the only thing you are asked is to state the definitions of sigma and pi bonding and to state the number of sigma and pi bonds in a molecule. Covalent bonds have two subdivisions, nonpolar and polar covalent. You must be able to distinguish between the two divisions. Polar covalent is the unequal sharing of pairs of electrons. Nonpolar covalent is the equal sharing of pairs of electrons. Electrons are constantly moving within the bonds of a molecule. I always imagine this as going to the cinema scenario. You and your friend are watching a movie and sharing a bag of popcorn. You notice that your friend is eating more popcorn than you are. While you are both technically sharing, it is in fact unequal sharing. You are polar covalent. Electrons may be shared within a bond, but they may be closer to one atom than another. To predict if a molecule is polar covalent or non-polar covalent, we must first study electronegativity. Electronegativity. This is a really important topic and appears several times throughout this course. It is so important that you give yourself as much time as possible to understand this concept. It will pay off in the long run. Electronegativity is defined as the relative attraction that an atom in a molecule has for the shared pair of electrons in a covalent bond. Let's look at HCl. You are told it is polar covalent. We can see that there are partial positive and partial negative charges attached to the atoms. The large atom will usually have the partial negative charge and therefore the smaller atom has the partial positive charge. Electrons are negative. Therefore, if an atom has a partial negative charge, the electrons are closer to that atom than the other. It is important that you put the dipole sign in front because if you don't, it is classified as an ionic bond, which obviously would be incorrect. The reason we use electronegativity values is to help predict if covalent bonds are polar or nonpolar. It was American chemist Linus Pauling who was responsible for the electronegativity table. Electronegativity can also be used to determine if a compound is ionic. The values are in your log tables, page 81. The next slide will explain how to predict this type of bonding using electronegativity. Using the electronegativity values in your log tables, you can figure out if a compound is ionic, nonpolar covalent, or polar covalent. Remember, Polar covalent simply means the unequal sharing of electrons. The table here will act as a guide. You have to learn this table off. When you are getting the values, you only need to get the values of the elements present and not the quantity of elements present. For instance, using water as an example, 
The electronegativity value for hydrogen is 2.2. We do not multiply this figure by 2 because there are two hydrogens present. We always take the lower number from the higher number. Any molecules that are not compounds automatically have electronegativity difference of 0. Example hydrogen gas. Fluorine is the most electronegative atom in the periodic table. There are always exceptions in chemistry. Before when using the electronegativity values, you could deduce if a compound was either polar or nonpolar covalent. Some molecules, even though they give a polar covalent result when using electronegativity values, they are actually in fact nonpolar. The reason is due to the molecules being symmetrical. In their examples, the center atom is delta positive, whereas the surrounding atoms are delta negative, and they are in a symmetrical fashion. The charges cancel each other out. Water is polar. If water were linear and not V-shaped, then it would not be a polar molecule. Van der Waals forces are the weakest forces between molecules. Strength is measured by boiling points. They are the only forces that can occur between non-polar substances. Note, a dotted line represents intermolecular bonds, whereas the single line represents intramolecular bonding, example polar or non-polar covalent bonds. For Van der Waals forces to occur, two molecules need to be in close contact, for example two hydrogen molecules. In order for the van der Waals forces to happen, the attractive forces need to be between a negative and positive dipole charge, because opposite charges attract one another. Dipoles are the partial charges within a molecule, and are represented by the Greek letter delta. Van der Waals are the weakest because the molecules have temporary dipoles. This means the electrons are moving about within the bond equally. Because they are always moving, they may become closer to one side than the other and within a split second they may move back to the other side. This changes the dipole of the atoms. Because van der Waals has to occur between oppositely charged dipoles, the intermolecular bonds break and reforms and breaks all due to the dipoles being temporary. This is occurring constantly and incredibly fast. The strength of van der Waals forces increases as the molecules get bigger. This is due to the increasing number of electrons. The more electrons, the bigger the electron cloud, therefore the easier it is to form temporary dipoles. There are temporary and permanent dipoles. Van der Waals is temporary, whereas dipole-dipole is permanent. Dipole-dipole bonds occur between polar covalent molecules, example HCl. Hydrogen is partially positive and chlorine is partially negative. Chlorine is the more electronegative atom, so electrons are closer to chlorine than the hydrogen. The partial charges within the molecule do not change, therefore the dipole-dipole forces will always remain intact. Because of the permanent dipole-dipole forces between molecules, it causes the boiling points to be much higher than van der Waals forces. Therefore the dipole-dipole bonds are stronger than van der Waals. This is why polar substances generally have a higher boiling point than non-polar substances. Hydrogen bonding is the strongest bonding between molecules. Hydrogen must be bonded to fluorine, oxygen or nitrogen for hydrogen bonding to occur. It does not work for any other element.